There we go. So uh, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, maybe it's morning somewhere. Um, this is our illumination of the intention class. We're going to begin with some uh, prayers, and then we'll do a little meditation. So Sheila, if you'd like to put up the prayers. Can you see that? I can see that, yeah. Okay. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. Through the collections I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit all migrating, all migrators. So we'll, we'll, let's chant in Tibetan the second, second two repetitions. Sange Chodang Soki Chognan Wa Jang Chodu Jap Sushi Dagi Chutu Kibe Chosanki Prola So that people can hear because they're a little, little uh, out of sync. Maybe you, uh, those of other than myself, if you can mute. If you're chanting, you can chant out loud, nice and loud, so that your your wife or children hear it, but uh, no one else can hear. Sange chudang suki chognam la, jangchu badu dagni kapsu chi, dagi chuje gi pe sonam ki, drola penchi sange drupa So you may have noticed I said. <clears throat> Dagi Chushe, because I'm teaching. If you're the teacher, instead of saying Dagi Chunyen, through listening to the Dharma, uh, you say Dagi Chushe, meaning to the merits of explaining the Dharma. Then short mandala, we'll say in Tibetan. Saji Poki Chukshing Meto. Tram ri rab ling ji ni de gyan pa di sang ge shing du mik te ul war gi tro kun nam dak shing la Chupashu Jesu Lama Dampa Ke Nam Ki Chuku Kala Kien Ze Ju Sin Ji Ji Tar Sampe Dul jays in mala sab ke chuki charpa abdu so iram guru radna mandalakam niryatayami. There we go. So we're going to begin with a little meditation as we've been doing. So sit comfortably. Spine erect legs in the Vajra Asana, if you can. My, kite, my uh, physical therapist who I saw for the first time Friday was when he was bending me around and said, oh, your, your legs are very flexible. And said, I've said in the Vajra, in the, you know, what they the people usually call the lotus posture. And this is not really, it's called, it's called the, the Vajra posture uh, for so many years. Spine erect, eyes partially closed, tongue on your palate, teeth slightly open. Pay attention to your breathing. 
And once you've recognized it, take it as the focus of your mindfulness. This should help you get rid of the other thoughts in your mind, plans, memories, observations about the present, emotional states, because focusing all of your attention on the breathing, if you do it really well, gives no space for those other thoughts to enter into your awareness. One sign of a little bit success at the beginning is that your breathing is becoming more regular, more shallow. Because generally, when you have good concentration, the respiration becomes less pronounced and more regular. then immediately, without any other device, turn your attention to your mental consciousness. Now, you've been using your mindfulness to watch the breathing, which is mindfulness is, although it's present in a certain sense in the sense consciousnesses, we were using the mental mindfulness. How do you see your mind? How do you see your mental consciousness? You see it through observing its contents. Thoughts, images, memories, plans, observations about the present, emotional states.
as we become familiar, just remembering immediately that these are this this content of your mind, these contents. are appearing within the clear light nature, the conventional clear light nature of the mind, which allows them to emerge from our consciousness and allows them to disappear from our consciousness. The thoughts don't go somewhere else when we're not attending to them. Like, like the moisture of a cloud on a sunny day. When the cloud begins to evaporate and we're left with just clear spy, clear sky behind it. It's conventional clear light nature, our developmental Buddha nature. We're trying to develop a mental image of the fact that the, the mind offers no resistance to thoughts entering or leaving. This is a resource we always have with us when things seem hectic or crazy. Remember, all appearances are just that, just appearances within the clear light nature of our mind. Even if we don't address emptiness, we can just see them as mere appearances and let go of them. We can develop all of the great qualities, clairvoyance, love, compassion, wisdom, renunciation, patience, incredible energy. We can become a generous person, even though till now we've been dominated by our self-cherishing and wanting to keep things, being miserly. This potential that we have, that we can recognize now, the recognition of it, the, the, the nature is always there, but the recognition of it is due to the fact that we have a life of leisure and endowment, what the Buddha called this auspicious moment. Everything, karmic conditions have come together that we're born as a human within a country where religion is free, at least for the time being. We have clear senses. We have we are living at a time when the Buddha, the teachings of the Buddha have not degenerated. The Buddha lived some 2,500 years ago, turned the wheel of Dharma, which is not always the case in many world systems. Those teachings still exist. There's a community of friends, Sangha, we can say, the community of benefactors that provide the resources we need. We have a basic faith, enough, enough that we're willing to dip our toe into the Dharma, like putting the, the, your toe in the hot bathtub, checking it out, whether it's safe or not, whether it's useful. This 
auspicious moment, life of leisure and endowment, the Buddha said was so rare, but so beneficial, so useful, so meaningful. When people talk about the meaning of life, we Buddhists would say, if you have a life of leisure and endowment, you're born with this in this auspicious moment. You can practice the Dharma without any hindrance. Even if you have bills to pay, if people criticize you with the right mental orientation, you can recognize how to take all of these into the path, how to transform these adverse conditions so they no longer form an obstacle, but become almost ornaments to your realizations. Amongst the various, various dharma realizations that we can use this life to enhance, three principal ones renunciation, bodhicitta, and the corrective view of reality, of ultimate truth, the view of emptiness, are most important. The material we'll be hearing about today is generally, is generally about the view of emptiness, although talking about the peripherally talking about bodhicitta and renunciation. Why would we want to develop these realizations? Because in doing so, we can find our own peace of mind. Be totally content, even at the time of death. Or we could reach, we could achieve nirvana, liberation in this life. Or if we're very fortunate, we have the right conditions, we could achieve enlightenment in this lifetime. Or at least leave imprints to make those realizations in future lives. becoming familiar with renunciation, bodhicitta, right view of emptiness. Why would we aim for enlightenment? Knowing that liberation from psychic existence would be less burdensome to achieve. Because we know, we've heard, we begin to realize that all living beings are in exactly the same situation as myself. Caught in the vast ocean of cyclic existence. Bobbing up and down, experiencing the three types of suffering. Circling within the six realms, never finding a moment of real peace. And that if we were to achieve liberation, if we were to escape from this ocean of cyclic existence for ourselves alone, we would leave all these other beings who are exactly equal with us in wanting to be happy, wanting to be free of suffering, who have been our mothers and have been depthlessly kind in numberless times in the past. We would be leaving them without a protector. Feeling a closeness with them, we call affectionate, affectionate love, developing compassion for them, great compassion. We develop a, a thought of bodhicitta to achieve enlightenment. 
not for ourselves alone, but as a state from which we can effortlessly, spontaneously, without any error, lead sentient beings perfectly out of suffering into everlasting happiness, the everlasting happiness of enlightenment. That's a motivation, bodhicitta motivation. Think, I will achieve enlightenment for the sake of all sentient beings. And as with that motivation, thinking, I'm going to listen, contemplate, and meditate on the material today. with that aim in mind, that, that information that I, I think about, I hear, I think about, I contemplate, I meditate. This can help me to become a real, authentic human being. Not harming others. Always in one way or another benefiting them. I'm going to participate today in order to achieve enlightenment for the sake of all mother sentient beings. And bring your attention back. Present. Good morning, Jennifer. Venerable Pamos there. Suvash. Suvansh. What does Suvansh mean, Suvansh? What does that what does that mean in uh Su good good family? Su is an intensifier and Vansh is family. So from a good family. Oh. Almost like son of the of the good lineage, <laughs> Suvan. Yes, yes. Yeah. And JC, who is a dear friend John Campbell, uh, who is also a good friend of Paul Hackett, who's is, is will Paul be here today, Jennifer? See off somewhere. He is in um, Austria with eighty four thousand project. Oh, okay. So I hope we. he listens later. Uh, I've known John for uh, dog years, uh, first through yoga and then through Buddhism. And he got his, uh, you, you have your doctorate with, with uh, Bob Thurman, right? From Bob Thurman? At yes. Yeah. 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 You're not no longer a student. So we have another. Always a student. Always a student. <laughs> Always a student. Right. Okay. So good to have you. So anyone have a question or comment left over? Everyone's, uh, Mikhail, nothing? Nadine? Huh? Kristen, something? No, okay. Okay, so, um, I'm going to just uh, reiterate a little about what we said last time. And uh, once again, I forgot to put down the page number. Uh, can, any, can anyone remind us what page in uh, Dupton Jimba's translation we're at? 73. Page 73. Thank you. I'm negligent in that because I have the electronic version. So it's pagination is completely different. So I'm going to go back a little bit before that. Um, we were talking earlier about the three fetters. Uh, Kunjor sum. 
some Yojana, I think. Um, so these were, uh, when, we, when we talk about someone who's on the first Bhumi, they have rid themselves, they have abandoned the three fetters or the three binding factors. So in the verse uh, that comes right after the verse one six that comes right after the four qualities such as being born in the lineage. It says he is born into the lineage of the Tathagatas as well. He or she has utterly purged the three binding factors, which many, many, you know, in the earlier days, everyone translated as fetters, usually from the, the Theravada teachings. Renowned, there's, there's a Pali word for that also. Such a bodhisattva upholds the state of supreme joy and has the power to shake a hundred worlds. So that's what we're talking about. And in, with regard to that, uh, there's a qualm. Someone might ask, given that uh, the bodhisattva and the first Bhumi has rid themselves of other negative tendencies as well. And here the word that Thupten Jimpa is translating as tendencies is the the word uh, in Tibetan, we say, um, uh, what do we say? Subtle increasers. Uh, I can't remember the Tibetan off the top of my head. Do I have it wrote here? Yeah. Agi? Was it? The Tibetan, you, Tragi, yeah. is it? Uh, yeah. Tag, uh, I think so, yeah, ta, tagge. Yeah. So tawa means subtle, gepa means uh, increasers. I think that's right. Um, Tupten Jimba has chose to translate it as tendencies because that, that Sanskrit word, which he mentions earlier, uh, anushaya. Yeah, I'll have it there. You know, uh, tagge like P-H-R-A means subtle and uh, gay means expand. Tage tesom, we were talking about. So uh, this in, in the Abhidharma literature is always used to refer to all of the delusions because they're subtle and they cause our contaminations to increase. So the, the qualm says, one might ask, given that he is he has rid himself of other negative tendencies as well as other you know other delusions to be abandoned on the path of, of seeing tendencies that are objects of elimination by the path of seeing that means these tage why are only 3 mentioned because there are at least 10 that are abandoned on the path of seeing so the reply is there appear to be two Two opinions on the interpretation of the intent of this statement from the sutra. Of these two, the better one is the one presented in the Abhidharma Kosha, the treasury of Abhidharma. So we went we went over this last time, just, just reminding. So uh, there's another uh, famous thing in Abhidharma Kosha. There's one question that comes in the Abhidharma Kosha. Why did the Buddha talk about five skandhas? You know, you talk about form, aggregate, five form skanda. And then you could you say, well, why don't I just say one other skanda mind, you know, has all of these things, the mental factors. Why do you differentiate feeling and discrimination out of the five skandhas uh, as separate skandhas? And uh, the Abhidharma Kosha explanation for that is supposed to be superior too, because it's the Abhidharma Kosha says, because uh, between the laity, or let's say the scholars and laity, uh, that which involves them with samsara, the laity is involved in samsara mainly through feelings, you know, wanting to feel good, wanting to avoid suffering. And the scholars are en engaged in cyclic existence through debate, through their discrimination. So the, those two factors, feeling and discrimination are centered out. So similar kind of argument, Abhidharma Kosha has all these good explanations. So here, um, the explanation of why these three uh, fetters, or uh, what did he call them? 
binding factors, why they're you know, put as a special case. So the, the, uh, the verse from the Abhidharma Kosha says, not wanting to go, choosing a wrong path, or harboring doubts about the path, these obstruct the journey to liberation. Therefore, these three are stated, implication meaning as principle, you know, that's the main ones. So what does that mean? If, if someone wants to travel to another place, for example, there are three main obstacles. Uh, if you want to go to, uh, well, Sheila's, Sheila's planning to go to Bodh Gaya and, uh, you know, Vulture's Peak and Varanasi soon with her sister. So three wrong obstacles, uh, not wanting to go. So maybe, you know, like this has to do with ego grasping, you know, um, the journey that we're talking about here, you know, going to uh, to abandon these delusions and everything is, is a path that's leading to liberation or enlightenment, right? So you might, if you have strong uh, view of the transitory collection, grasping at a self of persons, uh, you know, oh, I, I might disappear if I, you know, if I go there. So not wanting to go, choosing the wrong road, which would correspond to uh, amongst these delusions that are abandoned by the path of seeing, among these subtle increasers that are abandoned by the path of seeing, uh, the one that corresponds to choosing the road wrong road would be uh, adhering to wrong morality or modes of conduct. You know, thinking you could achieve liberation by standing on one leg or sitting between the ten fires. John, when you were in 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 Varanasi, did you see yogis? Oh, yeah. Some of these things, yeah. Sure. It's very sure. common, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, Genla, what page in the in the um, the uh, Illumination Tibetan script uh, text oh. are you on? Do you know? Uh, I don't know, but if you look, there are headlines in there every couple pages. So we're yeah. on the section. Uh, let's see. This one is four qualities, such as being born in the lineage. So you should be able to find it that way. We're on the on the on the first boomy. So it's just a little way down. I don't have that open right, right now. So right, right. I can't okay, tell you the page it. number. So okay. it's the first five grounds. All right, I'll figure it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So not wanting to go, choosing a wrong path, and harboring doubts about the path. So the third fetter or obstacle that would be relevant here would be uh, uh, afflicted doubt. So not, you know, thinking maybe things are inherently existent. So there's different kinds of doubt, right? Uh, you can doubt about what cereal to eat in the morning or what rice to buy at the market. Those are not doubts that are talked about here. Here we're talking about doubts, uh, afflicted doubt, which is relevant to your progression on the path, like whether past and future lives exist, uh, you know, whether enlightenment exists, uh, whether karma is valid, and so forth. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll read you. When some, for someone who wishes to travel to another place, for example, there are three main obstacles, not wanting to go, choosing the wrong path, and harboring doubts about one's road, one's path. The journey to liberation similarly has three principal obstacles. Due to the, due to the first, the view of the transitory collection, the chimpa translates as identity view. Okay, remember what that is. A view of the transitory collection is viewing your conventional self, observing that, and conceiving it to be inherently existent. That's called the view of the transitory collection or identity view. Due to that, one comes to fear liberation and does not want to travel there. Right? Due to the second, which Jimpa says third, the text says second, He's the reason he's saying third is because in a, earlier when he gave these three, uh, doubt was the third, but it's the, the Lama Sokapa's text actually says, due to the second, grasping at false views and false morality is superior, one relies on contrary paths and chooses the wrong path. And due to the third, which Jimpa translates here as second, although the text says third, 
he's basing it on his earlier explanation, afflicted doubt, one harbors doubts about one's path. You know, maybe it doesn't lead anywhere. So you, you, you don't actually engage in it. So these three are the principal fetters that keep one, uh, you know, that are, that are abandoned. They, they kind of keep you from progressing along the path and they are abandoned on the path of seeing these intellectually formed versions. So I just read this last time, but I didn't explain th this next section. This bodhisattva on the first ground, right? So from the Prasangika point of view, first ground means the path of seeing. You've entered when you've entered into the path of seeing, you become an Arya being. You've also you can also be labeled as having entered the first ground. The transition to the second ground is when you when you leave the path of seeing and enter into the path of meditation. And the, on the path of meditation, there's the second, third, fourth, five, you know, up till the 10th ground on the path of meditation. So this Bodhisattva on the first ground, having entered a confirmed lineage or definite lineage, that means the, the, the verse it said, he is of definite lineage of the Tathagatas. And so we talked a little bit about that before. Uh, you know, some individuals in the Hinayana path are definite at, at a certain point in their of their spiritual evolution. They might be definite of the Shravaka lineage. That doesn't mean that they will, uh, that's all they ever become. They will eventually become Buddha, but at that point, their path progression is definite of the Shravaka lineage or of the Pratika uh, lineage. Um, when we say the first ground Bodhisattva is of definite, definitely of the Tathagata lineage, a little bit more than saying definite Mahayana lineage, because now he's realized emptiness directly and he will practice with enthusiasm until he achieves that state, he or she achieves that state of being a Tathagata, of being a Buddha, an omniscient Buddha. So this Bodhisattva on the first ground, having entered a confirmed lineage, another way of saying the Tibetan text says definite lineage, as described above, they obtain the qualities that result from this and become free of the faults that are to be eliminated by this ground. I guess you could say, and, and, and become free of the faults that are eliminated by this ground, because you, you, you're talking about someone on the first ground. So once they've realized emptiness directly on the first ground, they have eliminated those three fetters, along with seven other uh, fetters, or intellectually formed delusions. As such, a unique joy arises within them. Yeah, that's one of the reasons. There's many reasons why there's joy, is why this ground is called the joyous. But one of them is this like a, a very special joy, like, you know, oh, wow. As such, a unique joy arises within them. And because they experience abundance of perfect jo joy, such a bodhisattva upholds the state that constitutes supreme joy. Jeffrey Hopkins, in his translation, if you have that other text I mentioned, Compassion in Tibetan Buddhism, there's a translation of the first five Bhumis that Jeffrey did uh, of Lama Tsongkhapa's text. There, Hop on page 142, he translated, a first, grown, a first ground bodhisattva has, as was explained before, entered a definite lineage, which Jimpa called confirmed lineage, he has attained the qualities of its fruits and is free from the faults abandoned by this ground. Among the, and, and, and also has this special joy. Okay, so possessing extraordinary perfect joy, this ground is known also as perfect joy or the joyous, whatever you want to say. T Tibetan, we say Raptu Gawa, you know, very joyous. On this ground, 
that Bodhisattva has the power to shake a hundred worlds. And I just re remind you, I, I mentioned last time uh, Zongzhag Kinzer Rinpoche and his commentary. You know, sometimes it's very, very general commentary, but I thought he had a nice take on shaking a hundred worlds. He said it was a little bit like uh, when Gorbachev uh, engaged in perestroika. Is that the right term? That it sort of shook the world. So sort of like, you know, in a sense, you might say Trump also is shaking the world, but not in this bodhisattva way, you know. Excuse me for some political comment. There. <laughs> okay, so now three qualities such as stepping on to higher grounds, or you could say uh, advancing to higher grounds. Do you see that in the in the Sanskrit in the in the Tibetan? John? No, I, I actually don't know where we are located in the Tibet. Okay. Let me see. But, um, you mean in the in the version that um that the Dupin Jimba's people put together? Yeah, I think he he's the main translator. He might have had some help. No, I'm talking about you were using the Yeah, no, I'm talking about the Tibetan, the Tibetan ver electronic version that um I believe his people put together in India, right? Yeah, yeah, right, right, yeah. But I don't know where that, what section we're on for that. So give me one example. You see you see some places where the text is is more compressed, sort yeah. of headlines. Yeah. Give me one that where you are. Uh, I mean, I'm just guessing. I'm, I'm... Read one, read one. Okay, hold on. Uh, it's page 27. Um, okay, so Niba. Uh, Riksu Gewa So Shive Yunden Ni. The two qualities of. So of this is, you know, Dini. This is the from, this is the root, uh, from the root. Something is second. <laughs> and then with a comment, uh, Riksu Gewa So Shi Yunden Ni and Dini. That's a verse. Okay, that sounds like pretty close. Maybe just look a little bit further when you see the when you see the headings. Yeah, uh, and then uh, the headings are are uh, a, a little bit in italic, even in the Tibetan script. Okay, uh, you're looking for three qualities such as advancing on. To the higher grounds, so I'll, I'll, I won't I won't mention any, any more about that because other people aren't following that. But just, no, don't don't take time with it. Thank you. Okay. I'll, yeah. I'll look it up. Okay, so the text says this is verse seven, the first three lines of verse seven, um, and when he says one seven, I guess what that means is that this is considered the the, the section of the first bumi, stepping on or advancing from one ground to another he or she travels perfectly to the higher ones. At that point, the paths to all lower realms are blocked for them. At that point, all the grounds of ordinary persons cease for them. Okay, he's using, he's, he's using the male all the time, him. So I'm trying to, to use uh, gender inclusive, <laughs> he or she or them. <laughs> Who here has pronouns? I know Diana had pronouns. She sent me something, you know, she said, I, I can't remember what she said. She, you know, she identified as female and so forth and so on. Anyone have any pronouns here? I know that's very popular. Okay. Just curious. Kristen, who did you say you were? You don't, you don't have any special? I don't use, I mean, I just... Use what I have been given. Uh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just curious. Okay. So what's going on here? Stepping on or advancing from one ground to another, <clears throat> they travel perfectly to the higher ones. So isn't that the case even before on the path of um, accumulation and path of preparation? They're, they're, here it's talking about ground to ground. So the, the grounds only start on the path of seeing, but couldn't you say that the one on the path of accumulation and preparation, uh, those bodhisattvas are also advancing? Well, yeah, but here there's something special about the first ground bodhisattva uh, advancing because they've uh, 
realized emptiness directly and they have a, a constant practice of the bodhisattva deeds. They never slack off on that. So their, their advancement you know, from ground to ground is very, very special. That's kind of the implication here. At that point, the paths to all lower realms are blocked or, uh, yeah, um, uh, yeah, I guess blocked is okay for him or her. Uh, what does that mean? It, that means that uh, that bodhisattva from the path of seeing, uh, they no longer will be born in the lower realms due to their karma. But doesn't that happen earlier? Shankar, do you know? We're on the on the on the Bodhisattva path. Actually, also on the hearer's path. Where is it also uh, recognized that one will no longer be born in the lower realms? Well, I mean, once you're in, go on. yeah. once you're an arhat, right? Oh, well, uh, way before then, yeah. Once, once you're an arhat, you're no longer born in samsara due to karma. Here we're talking about born in the lower realms, which is a smaller subset. Born in samsara includes being born as a human and a god and everything, right? So when you're an arhat, you're not going to be, you know, nirvana. The, the Hinayana conception is, um, in some in some cases, is that uh, one's mind is snuffed out, so you're no longer born at all in cyclic existence. Yeah, I know. I can't. I can't. Yeah, yeah I, I do remember now that, but I can't remember when. <laughs> okay, Don, do you do you remember? Don Eisenstein. I think you uh, can't go to the lower realms by the power of karma at the in the path of preparation, and there is conflict here between forbearance or peak. Right, right. Where, yeah, it's, you've read the first right. ground. You you can't go because causes the conditions will arise. Right. So earlier, on the path of preparation, when you when you reach the uh, the the level of that called uh, forbearance or patience, the patience level of the path of preparation, it's it's uh, it, it will come in, in a second more discussion of that. You no longer will be born into the lower realms but here now one the bodhisattva knows this okay at that point all the grounds of ordinary persons cease for him so we the continuing lama sunkapa's commentary says rejoicing greatly in stepping on or advancing from the first ground to the second well, he hasn't he's still on the first ground so he hasn't advanced to the second but is you know he's rejoicing greatly at the prospect of stepping on to the second ground, the Bodhisattva travels perfectly to the higher grounds. When the first ground is attained, at that point, for this Bodhisattva, the paths to all lower realms are blocked or have come to an end. Does that mean the Bodhisattva on the path of seeing, let's say in the first ground, can't be born as an animal? No? What do we think, Rachel? You said no. Uh, I think there's a distinction because you can be born as anything, as an as a bodhisattva or a Buddha um, at a certain point, uh, a bodhisattva. Um, so it's, a, it's got to do with that karmic, like you have to be born that right, way. Right, right. Yeah, necessity. You can make the yeah. choice, but you can't, you right. not have to be. So, for instance, in the Jataka tales, are you guys familiar with the Jataka tales? Ida, do you know? Have you heard the Jataka tales? The life stories of the former lives of the Buddha. Uh, very worthwhile reading. Uh, very inspiring. When I did my three year retreat, every day when I would come to the verse in the Seven Limb Puja on rejoicing, I would read one of the Jataka tales and rejoice what the Buddha did when he was a Bodhisattva. So most of those are when he's on the Bhumi. So uh, when he was on the first Bhumi and had a special 
practice of the perfection of generosity, he gave away his body and, you know, gave away his family, which would seem very irresponsible to someone today, a progressive in New York or something. Uh, but, uh, and then uh, when he was on the uh, third Bhumi, he practiced, the, he had a special practice of the perfection of patience. And even though a king was cutting off his ear and his nose and everything, he was he remained without, you know, disturbed mind. So <clears throat> in those Jataka tales, uh, some of them he was born as an animal on the Bhumis. So as Rachel said, uh, the Bodhisattva can can take rebirth in the lower realms through the power of their prayer and their the control of their mind but they will no longer be born in the lower realms due to their uh, their karma at that point. That That is with, you know, not wanting to go to the lower realms, they're born there. That, that, that would be our case right now, right? We don't want to go to the lower realms, but uh, we may be born in hell or as an animal or as a hungry ghost due to our karma. So one might ask, after attaining the peak stage of the path of preparation, and this is another uh, mistranslation by uh, Tupten Jimpa, the actual Tibetan text is patience. Peak is one of the levels. What are, what are the four levels? Don, you were, you're familiar. What are the four levels of the path of preparation? Uh, peak, which he peak, forbearance, and super. Yeah, heat is the first one. Peak is the second. Forbearance or patience, you can translate it as the third. And then highest mundane dharma is the fourth level, just before achieving the path of seeing. So there's somewhere in the path of preparation before then, Tupten Jimpa, the text is very clear. It says patience but he said, or forbearance. He says peak. So I'll read it the way it should be. The fact that it is impossible to go to the lower realms after attaining the forbearance stage is not because the seeds that lead to them have been destroyed by their antidotes, which would be the case on the path of seeing, right? On the pit, on the, <clears throat> the first Bhumi, once you've achieved the first Bhumi, uh, you have you have eliminated, uh, you have destroyed the seeds that can cause you to be born in the lower realms because you've, you've used the antidote of emptiness. So those seeds will no longer function, nor at the time of death will there be craving, grasping and, uh, to ripen a karmic seed into becoming to be born in the lower realms. But here on the path of preparation, on the patience level or the forbearance level, different ways of translating the same word, right? Like Lama Sopa, Sopa means patience, right? Or you could say forbearance, Lama, Lama forbearance, Lama patience. When Lama's, when Lama Sopa gives you gives you a hundred thousand prostrations to do or something, you might say he's testing your patience. Maybe that's why you might. Sometimes it. gets translated even as tolerance, right? Tolerance, yeah. Tolerance, yeah. Good. So the fact that it is impossible to go to the lower realms after achieving the tolerance stage or the patience stage is not because the seeds that have led them, that lead to them have been destroyed by their antidotes as they will be on the path of seeing. Rather, it is because no adequate conditions can converge anymore. Here on the first ground, in contrast, this is because their seeds have been destroyed by their antidotes. Jennifer, what do you think? Oh, I had a previous question. Uh, yeah. Thank you. About when the Bodhisattva manifests as an animal due to the power of prayer. Um, could you share more about the, the mind of the Bodhisattva manifesting as an animal and also the nature of the body? Is it um, 
like a projection of an animal or does it actually take you know the same form as an animal who would be reborn due to the power of delusion yeah so uh generally when one achieves the path of seeing one has what is called a yiki rangshengi lu uh so uh, a a psychic body one's body is a one's body is the nature of the mind <clears throat> so what that means say for instance the person who's sitting down on their meditation cushion about to achieve the uh path of seeing their body was one that was thrown by karma and delusion right it's actually flesh and blood uh but once when you once you achieve the path of seeing, your body transforms into a mental body. So there's some debate about that, whether the mental body is superimposed on the physical body that was there, or whether you're at, all the atoms of your body transform into the nature of mind. But at any, way, at any rate, um, that body is no longer a body of comprised completely of flesh and blood like ours are, or at least mine is. I, again, there may be some bodhisattvas here. I don't know. Uh, so uh, that the bodhisattva, if they were at, at, on the first bhumi, if they were to, uh, by choice, take rebirth in the lower realms, their body, Jennifer, would be one that is of the nature of the mind. Whereas on the path of preparation or the path of accumulation, they can also take rebirth in the lower realms, but their their bodies, they would have taken rebirth into the into the eggs or wombs of uh, you know those realms, and they would have bodies of flesh and blood. Is is my understanding? Make sense? So, where are we? Here on the first ground, in contrast, this is this is because their their seeds have been destroyed by the antidotes, the seeds to take rebirth in the lower realms. Are we all together? How are we doing? Making sense? Nadine, what do you think? Yes, thank you. I'm oh. following. <laughs> Okay, good comments. <laughs> yes, makes sense. Okay, so then the text continues. Uh, the compendium Avidharma, remember the Abhidharma, Abhidharma Samuchaya. Samuchaya is the like when we talked about Sutra Samuchaya, the, the text by Nargajuna that was a compendium or a, yeah. uh, anthology of sutra quotations. It's the same word, Samuchaya. The compendium of Abhidharma, which is sometimes called the Mahayana Abhidharma text written by a Sangha, uh, that also describes the aggregates and elements of the lower realms as objects to be eliminated by the path of seeing. Yeah, John, we can hear you. So you, you oh, I'm sorry. Mute, mute, mute until, you, until you want to say something that we hear. Yeah. <laughs> Nice. John's reading the Tibetan text. Okay. So at that, at the point when the Bodhisattva attains the first ground, all the grounds or states of ordinary persons cease for them. So they're no longer an ordinary person. When, when we use the word ordinary person, soso kewo in Tibetan, um, ordinary person in this context means a non-arya someone who has not realized emptiness directly. So even someone on the path of preparation who has a you know, union of calm abiding and, and penetrative insight, realizing emptiness conceptually, they're still an ordinary being. So at the point when the Bodhisattva attains the first ground, all the grounds or states of ordinary persons cease for them. Okay, makes sense. Mikhail. Uh, about these seeds um, um, leading to the lower realms, they've been eliminated um, due to his merit. 
you know, they've been eliminated on the path of C you're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. They've been eliminated due to the power of the antidote. It's what's called uh, um, analytical cessation. So there's two kinds of cessations that are mentioned in the Abhidharma. Uh, there's non-analytical cessations and analytical cessations. Analytical cessations means by the power of analysis, that's where the analytic, you know, that comes in. Um, you have realized emptiness uh, and realized it directly. And as a result of that, you have ceased certain delusions, not all of them at one time, because the, the delusions are ceased sequentially through the path of seeing, path of meditation. So for instance, when we talk about the four noble truths, right? What are the four noble truths, Mikhail? Do you know? Um, there is the Paul suffering, <laughs> suffering, the origin, the cessation, and the path. Good. Okay. Someone last week, somewhere they put path before cessation. So usually, uh, as you said, the, the truth of suffering, the truth of the origin of suffering, the truth of cessation, and the truth of the path. So truth of cessation means that um, one has a has achieved an analytical cessation of delusion, so they will never come back again. They cease the delusions and their seeds, their potentials, so they'll never come back again. And uh, so, what I, I can't. What, what what was the question you were asking about, about the seeds leading to the lower realms? So right. all these seeds are. Um, eliminated through analytical cessations. Yeah, that means that because you've realized emptiness, which is an antidote to the to the intellectually formed delusions on the path of seeing, there, there's those are the only kinds of delusions that are abandoned on the path of seeing. Intellectually formed, the innate forms of the delusions won't be eliminated until the you get to the second ground. And uh, their antidote becomes stronger and starts to eliminate those innate forms. Now it's just the intellectually formed ones on the path of seeing on the first ground. Uh, they are abandoned in the sense that they will never return. The, the, you know, let's say the delusions obviously are no longer present. You might think, well, maybe the seeds of them are still present, but even the seeds have become uh, impotent, whether there's some debris <laughs> left in the mind, you know, uh, you know, certainly the delusions don't no, no longer manifest. So they're abandoned, the intellectually formed delusions, but the seeds of them, well, like, like say, for instance, when we do, uh, when we apply the four opponent forces, Someone, maybe one of the earlier classes, I said the five opponent forces, and someone reminded me there are four opponent forces, George, not five. So when you, when you talk about the four opponent forces, uh, the force of regret, well, let's say when we do confession, it's, uh, you know, when you apply these forces, it's as though they cause the karmic seeds to experience suffering in the future to become impotent, like say, like the example I give sometimes, if you have seeds for your garden, you know, and inadvertently you put them on a um, cookie sheet and into the oven at 350 for a couple of hours, uh, even if you planted them, uh, there might be a little teeny sprout come up, uh, but it would be meager. You wouldn't get your tomato plant or anything like that. Maybe they wouldn't grow at all. Maybe one of them that resisted the heat uh, might grow a little. So that's that's equivalent to a, a, a non-analytical cessation. You know, you're 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 causing them to be uh, diminished. Here, the the potency of the seeds are uh, of the intellectually formed delusions are completely eradicated. So they they. They don't. They won't give rise to delusions again in the future. Okay. 
Okay. At this point, when the Bodhisattva attains the first ground, all the grounds or states of ordinary persons cease for him. Then, presenting the qualities together in a summary. So this is talking about the seventh verse, the last line of it. When it says 17D, right after that verse there, it says 17D. So I guess he's uh, he's using one to mean all of the verses up through the first Bhumi, and then two verses that begin with two dot something will be of the second Bhumi and so forth. So he is this, and D means the fourth line. Usually in Tibetan, the the verses or shalokas have four lines. In Sanskrit, they just have two lines. Sort of like the, the first two lines of the Tibetan form one pada or one line of the Sanskrit. And then the second two lines, uh, when I say the second two, you know, the third and fourth line of the Tibetan form the second line or the, what they call pada. Pada actually means foot or, you know, in one sense, but it's a line. He is described clearly in terms akin to the eighth aria. We talked about this before. Uh, the Tibetan text, you could translate akin as just like. He is described clearly in terms likened to the eighth aria. And so, um, Richard, remember what the eighth aria is? We, we've talked several times about this, so I, I think you know. You caught me just about uh, just getting ready to look it up. Oh, okay. So, okay, I'll help. So, remember when we talked about uh, the, the the four types of arias? Oh, Street right. Emperor, um, never, return, never returner. Oh no. Okay. No, wait. Wait. So, stream enterer, once returner, non returner, or you could say never returner, and arhat. Those are four kinds of arias. Each of them. Uh, have two versions. Someone who is entering into a uh, stream enterer and one, one who is abiding in the fruit of stream enterer. One who is entering into once returner and one in, who is abiding in the fruit of once returner and so forth. So that, that makes those four then become eight, right? Each of them have an enterer and an abider in the fruit. So if you count down from Arhat all the way down, because there's eight, what would what would the eighth aria be? The, if, it would, if you count down from from Arhat and Arhat is one, then the eighth ar, then the eighth aria would be the um, entering the stream enterer. Exactly. Okay. okay. So entering into stream enterer. So he is described clearly in terms that they are like the enterer into stream enterer, in other words, right? The eighth aria. In brief, the eighth aria being eighth counting down from the top, uh, counting from the top down the four abidings in the fruits and the four entering in the fruits, has entered the fruit of stream enterer because he has attained the attributes of an aria and enjoys the qualities of abandonment and realization commensurate with this stage. Enjoys the qualities and abandonments. Well, let's say enjoys. He has these, has these qualities and uh, has the realizations, has the qualities of abandonment. That means what is abandoned. What he's abandoned are the all of the intellectually formed delusions or the subtle increasers. And he has the realization of direct realization of emptiness. Akin to this eighth being, eighth Arya being, or like the eighth Arya being, like the enterer to stream enterer, or the what is what's he say here? Abiding the fruits, entering, yeah, the enter and the stream enter. Um, this bodhisattva also is described clearly as enjoying the qualities of abandonment and realization 
due to his or her having attained the first ground, right? Hopkins translates it, uh, this bodhisattva is extinguishing of faults and arising of auspicious qualities, which are due to his having attained the first ground, are shown, sim are shown in a similar manner to those of the eighth superior, the eighth aria. Okay, same, same thing. We're all together? Paul, did you notice who's right above your head? I believe I do. <laughs> Long time no see, right? <laughs> right. Okay. So he's going to, hopefully he's going to come and visit me at the hermitage uh, if it's still working out after he visits one of his children. Wonderful. Thanksgiving. Fantastic. Okay. So the quality, next, the qualities that outshine others' mental continua. Continua is the plural of continuum, right? Or you could say continuums. The qualities that outshine others' mental continuums or continua, if you want to be stickler in the grammar. This has three parts. Okay, so what we talked about, what was the, the previous thing? Presenting the, the qualities together in a summary. Before that was the three qualities, such as stepping onto higher grounds. Those were qualities that they had. Now, the qualities that outshine others' minds, others' mental continua, right? This is three parts. How, on this ground, the first Bhumi, Shravakas and Pratika Buddhas are outshone by means of the Bodhisattva's lineage. Right? What's the Bodhisattva's lineage? He's entered into the Tathagata lineage, right? How, on the seventh ground, Shravakas and Pratika Buddhas are outshone by means of the Bodhisattva's intelligence. So you might be a bit confused. Why is it talking about the seventh ground? We're just talking about the first ground, right? So we say on the first ground, the bodhisattva outshines. There's the Tibetan word, uh, zilginun. So pressing down by your zil, by your brilliance. So you say outshining. So for instance, uh, uh, at night, the stars are shining in the sky. When the sun rises, the sun's brilliance presses down, suppresses the, the light from the stars. Does it suppress? Well, what it means is that the, the sun's brilliance is so great, you can't see the stars any longer unless there was an eclipse. Have you ever noticed that when there's a full eclipse of the sun? You can, then suddenly you see the stars in the sky. They were always there, but they're outshined by the 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 brightness of the sun so on the on the uh on the first bhumi this bodhisattva out, outshines uh the shravakas and pratika buddhas by means of his lineage his or her lineage later you might think well aren't they they've realized emptiness directly don't they outshine the hearers and solitary realizers in terms of wisdom or intelligence well no the We'll see soon in the text, from the Prasangika point of view, Chandrakirti's, Nargajuna's interpretation of Prasangika, Lama Tsongkhapa's interpretation, the hearers and solitary realizers also realize the same emptiness. So that bodhisattva on the path of seeing doesn't excel the hearers and realize, uh, solitary realizers in terms of their wisdom or intelligence. Okay, that'll only come later on the seventh Bhumi. And then the third, uh, when we talk about the qualities that outshines others' mental continua, the third one is concluding implications of these statements. Okay, we're all together? We're all, we're all here? Doubts? Okay. So next, how on this ground, the first Bhumi, Ground is English translation of Bhumi, right? Shravakas and Pratika Buddhas are outshone by means of the Bodhisattva's lineage. How the Bodhisattva outshines them uh, by his lineage or her lineage. Even when abiding on the first ground of the mind for full awakening. So the, the Tibetan 
an, another way of translating this is even abiding in the mind of complete enlightenment's initial view. So what, the, what does that mean? Didn't he have the mind of enlightenment? Didn't he have the, 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 uh, the bodhicitta before? Before the first Bhumi? Paul, do you remember? I believe so, but I would suspect this means the ultimate bodhicitta. Yeah, yeah. So it's, so it's talking about it's infiltrating here now, saying that this bodhicitta um, is sort of ultimate bodhicitta, right? So it's not just talking about, so even abiding in the mind of complete enlightenment's initial view, the initial view of the uh, of bodhicitta, it's talking about ultimate bodhicitta, even abiding in the first ground of the mind for full awakening. Yeah, he, they, they, both this and other translators have left out this, this, uh, these words, initial view, um, which you can find in the Majamaka Vatara uh, root text. I don't know why they've left that out. So it's it's talking about this first view. And it's sort of more implying that it's a view of emptiness, right? Even abiding on the first ground of the mind for full enlightenment, or the first view of the ground of the full enlightenment, full awakening, he surpasses those born from the sage's speech and the Pratika Buddhas. Who's born from the sage's speech? So the sage here means uh, the Muni, right? Munindra means the Buddha, right? Who who are born from the Buddhist speech? Doris, do you remember? Shravakas, hearers. Yeah. Well, also the prati aren't the in the in the one of the first verses of the text said the hearers and solitaire and middling Buddhas. Are born. Oh, and them too. Yeah. So, but here, here it's it's kind of uh, a little bit ambiguous why he mentions also the Pratika Buddhas, because they're also born from the Buddha's speech. But as you said, your first your first thing, he suppresses those born from the the Muni's speech, meaning the hearers, as well as the Pratika Buddhas, through the power of his merit. So, because he's reached this. Tathagata lineage on the first Bhumi, he has, he surpasses, far surpasses uh, the uh, hearers and solitary, solitary realizers in terms of merit. So when we talk about the joyous ground, the first Bhumi, um, there's some, you know, in the Hinayana texts that criticize the Mahayana, they say, how can you call the how do you say the bodhisattva goes from joy to joy? You know, how is he joyous? Because uh, there is no joy in cyclic existence. You know, it's all the nature of suffering, right? So how can he have joy? So here we're talking about because of the merit that the bodhisattva has, uh, their mind is um, experiencing mental happiness all the time. So even when abiding in the, the first view of the mind of full awakening, he surpasses those born from the sage's speech, the Muni's speech, and the pre, as well as the Pratika Buddhas, through the power of his or her merit. And this merit increases ever more. Why does it increase ever more? Because they're always engaging in the bodhisattva activities at this point. There's never a time when they're lacking uh, the bodhisattva activities. Making sense? Suvansh, you of good lineage, <laughs> good family. Okay, so continuing, let alone on the second, yeah, leave, leave aside the second and third, fourth, subsequent grounds of the mind for full awakening, bodhicitta, even when abiding on the first ground, you know, obviously in the second and third, fourth grounds, they surpass the 
hearers and solitary realizers in merit even more. But even on the first ground, through the power of his merit of conventional awakening mind and compassion. So when it says the merit of, that means the merits that are accumulated by uh, the having of uh, the having conventional bodhicitta, as well as compassion, the merits that are accumulated because you have that and whatever actions you do become much more powerful. So for instance, when we do our meditation at the beginning, right, we try to set a motivation, even if it's contrived bodhicitta, that is not spontaneous bodhicitta, by that, that motivation, the merit that we accrue during to motivating for that out of conventional bodhicitta to listen to the teachings to achieve enlightenment for the sake of sentient beings, the merits that we accrue listening become much greater than someone that didn't have that motivation. It's something similar, right? You following, Sheila? Make sense? Okay. Okay. Let alone on the second and subsequent grounds of the mind for full awakening, even an abiding on the first ground through the power of his merit of conventional awakening mind and compassion, he surpasses, that is to say, outshines the shravakas who are born from the sage's speech and the pratika buddhas. So in a sense, they're both born from the sage's speech, but they, Chandrakirti is separating them here. And their merit increases ever more, unlike those two, the hearers and solitary realizers. Well, the, aren't the soli hearers and solitary realizers, doesn't their merit increase as they continue on the path of meditation and so forth toward our, our hardship? Yeah, but not like not like not like the bodhisattvas. Bodhisattvas, uh, you know, their merit increases even more, and they go from joy to joy. This then is another distinctive quality of the bodhisattva behind, beyond the qualities mentioned above. So we talked about other qualities. Now this is. This, this quality of outshining them by their merits on the first bhumi is, be, is in addition to those other qualities that we talked about. In relation to this, the liberating story of Maitreya Sutra, so uh, when we say liberating story, John, do you know what, this, what they're translating there? That must be Namtar, right? Namtar, yeah. So, uh, Nampartawa means uh, complete liberation, right? So one way of talking about biographies, of, like say, if you talk about the biography of Lama Tsongkhapa, you talk about Lama Tsongkhapa's Namtar. The, you might say uh, liberation, complete liberation. What it means is the story of how he became, biography is like how he became enlightened, right? How he became liberated. That's kind of the the sense of it. Uh, the word story doesn't is not part of the actual Sanskrit or Tibetan, but it's sort of like the liberation of Maitreya Sutra. So that's the the sort of like the the story of how uh, you know, sort of like biography of Maitreya, how he becomes uh, enlightened. So it says, "Child of the lineage." What's the child of the lineage? You know, Riki Pu in Tibetan, we say uh, Kula Putra, Kula Putra. Snehi, what, what are you thinking? I was just curious, Venerable George, you know, when these comparisons are made between um, Shravakas and Prateka Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, um, are these coming from the sutras which say that? You know, Bodhisattva surpassed them in all these different ways. Yeah, in fact, we're coming to those quotations. Yeah. But like the sutras from the Buddha's times. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Here, here is quoting uh, the, <laughs> what is it? The, what is it called? Here? Chapter 54 of the Avatamsaka. Remember, we talked about the Vaipulya sutras. There's several, there were some first 
Mahayana sutras. Some of them were called Vaipulya, you know, very, very extensive. And each of the chapters was like a, another sutra. They might have been like an amalgamation of other sutras that were put together. The Avatamsaka is one of them. And in the Avatamsaka, the, the 54th chapter of that is this, this particular sutra. Okay, the, the Maitreya Namtar. So that's a sutra that was Mahayana's belief that the Buddha actually spoke, right? It the, we can trace it back to the about the time of Nargajuna, because when Nargajuna wrote his Sutra Samuchaya, compendium or anthology of of sutras, he quoted the Maitreya. Uh, this, you know, he quoted the Avatamsaka and the various chapters of it. Uh, so this, we Mahayanas believe that the Buddha actually taught this at the time of the Buddha. So this quotation is not just something Lama Tsongkhapa made up, or it was a, a biography that was written by someone later about Maitreya. This is a, a sutra uh, telling the story of Maitreya that the Buddha taught. Okay, Snehi, does it make sense? Snehi? Um, I don't know. I just, I always like feel bad at these comparisons. I feel like the Arhats are always like <laughs> not being proper, properly represented. Oh, and, yeah. And that, yeah, yeah. The, you know, and that the Mahaya, I mean, there's so much controversy also over the Mahayana Sutras and how they were produced and so forth. I don't know. It's just Well, there's also controversy about uh, the Hinayana Sutras also. So, let, let, so let's take an aside here. So one of the uh, important topics that were brought up by the later uh, scholars, like say um, Nargajuna, Bhava Viveka, uh, Buddha Palita, Buddha Palita, Bhava Viveka, and um, Shanti Deva is what's called uh, Tekchen Kadup. What does Tekchen mean? Paul, do you know what Tekchen Kadup means? Uh, Tekchen is obviously Mahayana. Kadup, I'm not recognizing that. So, phrase. Ka, like in Kangur speech, Ka is uh, honorific for speech. Oh. Establishing the, the the verbal authority of the Mahayana. Yes. Yeah, right. So, you know, just like like Snake saying, oh, there's all this controversy about whether the the Buddha taught these. You know, so that's what the Hinayanas, uh, Hinayana, uh, you know, when the Mahayana became more apparent after the time of Nargajuna, they said, oh, the Mahayana is just a figment of in that imagination. Uh, you know, like a sky flower. You know what a sky flower is? Like a, if you were to see a flower in the sky that didn't, that wasn't connected to the earth, it's like something that can't exist, right? It has to have something connection to the earth. So like sky flower is an example. It's sometimes used to talk about something that looks like something, but it doesn't really exist. You're like the son of a barren woman. Have you heard of that? Son of a barren. Does a barren woman have any sons? Well, maybe she became barren after she gave birth. But anyway, usually we talk about barren woman it means someone who can't give birth to children. So, um, so very very important subject. Also in the Mahayana Sutra Alamkara, there's a whole chapter on establishing the Mahayana as actually the proclamation of the Buddha, the Kajup. You know, establishing, droop means establishing, ka means speech or proclamation. So uh, in that, there are, well, maybe we'll, when, we, when, when it arises again, maybe we can go over it a little bit, it's incredibly good arguments. If I say truncheon arguments, is that the right word? Can I say truncheon arguments, good arguments? Uh, I think trenchant. Trenchant? trenchant. Yeah, yeah, I think truncheon is what you get knocked over the head. Oh, <laughs> the truncheon. Okay, thank you. So, good, good arguments um, that the Mahayana uses, and then they would say, say for instance, 
um, why are you so sure the Buddha taught the sutras? You know, that the, the, the Buddha taught the, the Pali canon and so forth. So there are many, many, we'll talk about that later when it comes up again, but uh, suffice it to say that the, the great uh, originators, you know, the early lamas from Nargajuna onward uh, had to deal with these kind of things. So you say, oh, but there's all this controversy. You know, the, the controversy also only comes from the, uh, the Hinayana. And the same arguments that they use to dispute uh, the Mahayana Sutras can be used to dispute their canon. Okay, so maybe a good debating technique for political debates. Okay, anyway, let, let's let's continue a little bit. So, good question. So the the uh, Jimpa's translation says here, "Child of the lineage." So uh, this is Buddha talking to uh, one of the bodhisattvas. I'm not sure if he's talking to Maitreya here or another bodhisattva in the sutra. Child of the lineage, it is like this. The son of a king, born not long ago, bears the name of royalty. Right? So you're not talking about a son when he's six or seven years old. It's just, you know, newly born son of the king the infant, right, bears the name of royalty. They're the royal son. They're the, the king's son, the, the Rajaputra. Rajput is the name of a, of a town in India. Have you been there, Snehi? Have you been to Rajput? Mm -hmm. Rajput is short for Rajaputra. In modern Hindi, they cut off the final A's on words, right? So instead of saying Rajaputra, they say Rajput. That just means prince, son of the king. The son of a king born not long ago, infant, in, infant son of a king, bears the name of royalty. They're the royal son, right? And because of the greatness of their family lineage, he outshines the entire assembly of senior and chief ministers at court. Is that right? When the when the 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 king's son is born, is more important because he's royal lineage than all the other ministers. So, like, say for instance, now, um, what's uh, Prince Charles's two sons? One of them is going to be is the son in line, right? What's his name? Harry That's and William. William is the one in lines. Harry is maybe get may get the short end of the stick, but anyway, William's in line. So when William was born, um, at that time he was more important than the prime minister, uh, everything else, because he's of royal lineage, right? That's what's being talked about here. Okay, so he outshines the entire assembly of senior and chief ministers at court. Margaret Thatcher, I don't know if she was around and she was outshone by <laughs> if she was likewise the Bodhisattva at the beginner's stage. So this is talking about the path of seeing now, not the Bodhisattva when he just have conventional Bodhicitta on the path of accumulation. The Bodhisattva on the beginner's stage, who has generated awakening mind not so long ago, has been born into the lineage of the sovereigns of Dharma, the Tathagatas. So this is obviously talking about the person in the path of seeing, not the path, the person who has not long ago developed conventional bodhicitta. Because of his awakening mind, because of their bodhicitta and compassion, they outshine the Shravakas and Pratika Buddhas who have practiced pure conduct over a long time. What does pure conduct mean? Does anyone know? Palma, Venerable Pamo, are you there? Maybe Venerable Pamo is making Tibetan tea. Okay. So when, when it says pure conduct, do you know what that means? No, I'm not answering. You're not answering. <laughs> 
So I think it's it's what we call brahmacharya. So anyone know what has heard the term brahmacharya? Sumvansh, uh, what is in India? What? Oh, he's he's gone. Uh, Snehi, do you know what what does brahmacharya mean in uh, India today? Usually, it refers to like sexual restraint. You, yeah, it can but, mean that, right? Uh, but oh. I've also heard it say it's it's sort of like um, practicing practicing in the tradition of like the Brahmins, like just keeping pure vows and. Uh, practicing it, conduct, morality, and so forth. In some in some cases, it can mean like that. But in Buddhism, uh, the brahmacharya uh, has to do with, uh, you know, pure conduct of celibate behavior. So that not not only celibacy or avoiding sexual conduct, but all of the other things uh, that all the other vows one takes when one takes the, the vows of a monk or nun. So, you know, in the, the sutra, uh, what do they call the chishak, the general confession sutra and other sutras, when you talk about, um, you know, uh, not criticizing those who are fellow companions in pure conduct. That means others who are living in the vows. So although in one sense, brahmacharya can refer to abstention from sexual conduct, contact, uh, in a wider sense, it means all the vows that are taken at the time, uh, that that being, you know, the, the, all of the all of that conduct of the monk or nun being called brahmacharya, okay, or or pure conduct. So he outshines the shravakas and pratika buddhas who have practiced pure conduct. That means being monk, monks or nuns. Uh, the, all the merit they've accumulated over a long period of time, which is immense, right? Making sense? Who is a doubt? Okay, no doubts. Then, um, did I say which one that is? So you can find this quote if you look in the in the the 84,000 website. Remember, there's a site. Uh... Paul, you're, you're, you're doing something for 84,000 in Austria right now, right? Yeah, we're here at a meeting uh, discussing uh, the Vajra Tantra and commentaries. Okay, so 84,000. You, if you could just type in Google 80, 84 comma 000, the first thing that will come up probably is the 84,000 website, uh, which was... I think more or less started by Zongso Kensei, right, Paul? Yeah, exactly. After the first conference we had in India uh, that Robert Thurman organized, um, Translators Conference, which I happened to be, some strange coincidence I was invited to. And uh, His Holiness told Zongso Kensei Rinpoche, Zongso Kensei Rinpoche wanted to translate all of the Kangyur, that means the you know the the tripitaka, tripitaka the, the 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 vinaya the sutra the abhidharma pitaka and La, and his holiness said first you should translate the the tengur the commentaries he said before you translate the commentaries it's very very difficult to get a good translation of the of the sutras and so forth but uh Zongzar Kensei Rinpoche has his own mind and he decided to translate first all of the all of the kangir. So uh you know, so maybe it has some merit there. So there, there so in that in that website you can actually find uh in the Avatamsaka, you go to chapter 54, verse 291, and their translation for what we just translated there says, noble one, what we translated as son of the lineage or something. Not long after a prince has been born, he outshines the highest ministers who are his seniors through being of noble birth and sovereignty. In the same way, not long after the bodhisattvas have developed the aspiration for enlightenment, so one has to understand here the context meaning the not just uh, is it, aspiration for enlightenment means bodhicitta, we have to understand the ultimate bodhicitta, 
not long, uh, or is it in the same way, not long after the bodhisattvas have developed ultimate bodhicitta through being born in the family of the Dharma kings, the Tathagatas, they're born in the Tathagata lineage, right? Even though they are beginners through the sovereignty of their of the great compassion of the aspiration to enlightenment. Here, our text takes the two terms differently. Their great compassion and bodhicitta. They outshine all the shravakas who are their seniors in having practiced celibacy. So he takes pure conduct as just celibacy or the translator of that section for a long time. So that's the same, same verse, right? So if you want to, if you want to see uh, a lot of these quotations, you can go to the 84,000 website. First, you go to the Avatamsaka, and then you go through the chapters till you come to the, the uh, liberating story of Maitreya. So then he continues, child of the lineage, it is like this. What is, it is like this. What is that? Does anyone know? You say it every day, not, maybe not every day. Some, if you say mantras, when you say tadyata, what does tadyata mean? It is like this. Venerable. Yes. That brings up a question for me. Is it tadyata or tajata? <laughs> so the Tibetans say tayata because if you know if they try to transliterate it into Tibetans, it's it's T A D, Tad. And in Tibetan, if something ends in D, like we say, instead of saying Padma, Padma for lotus, they say Pema, right? They don't sound the D in Tibetan and they change the vowel before it, like saying Pema instead of Padma. So here, Hadyata, the Tibetans would say. Tayata, they don't say the D, and the instead of saying Tad, the Tai, similar to Padma and Pema. Make sense? Okay, so it's actually in, in Tibetan, Tadyata, Tadyata means it is like this. So that comes at the beginning of a lot of mantras. You know, it's like, you know, Tadyata Om Muni Muni Maha Munaye Soha. It is like this. So child of the lineage, it is like this. The newborn offspring of a Garuda, the king of birds. I think someone's translate, maybe Jeffrey's translation said eagles. <laughs> uh, what did he say? child of good lineage, it is like this. For example, soon after the birth, after its birth, the offspring of the great king of eagles, Jeffrey translates. So it's, it's talking about Garuda. You've heard of the Garuda, right? Big, big mythological bird in India. Do Garuda still exist, Suvansh, in India? Uh, George, I'm sorry, I don't know. Okay. I think maybe mythological, okay? So child of lineage is like this. The newborn offspring of a Garuda, the king of birds, has qualities such as strength of wings, total clarity of vision, being able to see in immense distances, and so on, that do not exist in mature birds of all other breeds. Make sense? You know, like say, like... Uh, what do we say? Um, have you heard, have you people heard of sky burial in Tibet? Nadine, have you heard of sky burial? What is that? What is sky burial? And they um, give the body to the um, vultures. The vultures, right? Yes. So, uh, so the vultures are coming from the sky as opposed to, so they do, in some cases, they bury people that would be called earth burial. Fire, burial by fire is cremation. Uh, water burial <laughs> is putting the corpse in, floating in the Ganges River to be devoured by the bacteria and the alligators and so forth. And there are alligators in the Ganges some places. And uh, air, uh, sky burial means, as Nadine said, 
bringing the corpse up to a high place that uh, has been used before for this kind of ritual. The body is cut up into pieces uh, and the vultures then start circling over and come down. And finally, uh, at the end, the well, maybe even before the end, they would cut off the top of the skull of the person uh, with the brain and put it together with some sampa and other things. And uh, once the vultures have devoured uh, all of the meats and sinews and uh, grease and everything of the of the body, uh, the skull cup is offered with the brain. And that's sort of like the cue for the vultures to leave. And so it's like, this is the end. <laughs> that's called sky burial. So um, it's said that vultures have uh, a kind of clairvoyance to know that there is a dead body. Uh, so even there on the other side of the mountain, they know that there is a corpse there so they, they don't have to do any special ritual to call the vultures. They sometimes, they sometimes come. So I'm using that to, to, we're going to say the, the Garudas, uh, by the strength of their wings, their total clarity of vision, so maybe they have some kind of clairvoyance also, that do not exist, exist in mature birds of, of other, all other breeds. Likewise, a bodhisattva who has generated the first ground of the awakening mind, or we could say the first view of the awakening mind is the, 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 the Tibetan actually says, um, has thus perfectly penetrated the ongoing lineage of the great Garuda-like Tathagatas. What is that? A Bodhisattva who has generated the, the first ground of the awakening mind and has thus perfectly penetrated the ongoing lineage of the great Garuda-like Tathagatas, maybe there should be a comma, has qualities, the powerful wings of his generation of the awakening mind aspiring for the omniscient state, means the uh, ultimate bodhicitta, the power eclipsing others like the wings of a Garuda out, off, offspring, and the clarity of his vision of utterly pure altruistic intention. He has those qualities that do not exist in the Shravakas or in all the Pratika Buddhas that have definitely shunned cyclic existence. They have renunciation. They've, you know, definitely shunned cyclic existence for a hundred or for a thousand eons. Jeffrey translates that that part. There are, there are two different verses, and if you go to the the eighty four thousand and you look for that, you can find those verses. Where are we here? Jeffrey Hopkins translates that part. Child of good lineage, it is like this. For example, soon after its birth, the offspring of a great king of eagles has power in his wing and clarity of eye that none of the older birds have. You know, other kinds of birds other than the, the Garuda or the king of eagles. Similarly, a bodhisattva who has generated the first ultimate mind of enlightenment, Jeffrey puts in parentheses ultimate, has taken birth in the lineage of the great Tathagata king of eagles, king of Garudas, as an offspring of the king of eagles, he out overpowers others through the strength of his own wings to generate an aspiration to omniscience, and he has the pure eye of special thought. These features do not occur in any of the hearers and solitary realizers who have practiced renunciation. What did he say here? Who have shunned cyclic existence. Jeffries just calls it you know, who have practiced renunciation for a hundred thousand eons. You know, you might think practicing renunciation for a hundred thousand eons would accrue a lot of merit, right? So the, the bodhisattva uh, who has achieved this first bhumi uh, overpowers them. Okay, make sense? Ida, what do you think? 
You have a question? Uh, it makes sense, Venerable. Yes, no, I don't have a question. Thank you. Oh, okay, okay. Rachel, are you, you following? You're usually following. Okay. Shanka, are you awake? Yeah, okay, okay. Just checking. Sean, I can't tell you're in the dark there. You're okay? Okay, you don't want to say anything. Okay, My, Mikhail, you have a question or comment? Um, yeah, uh, about this special intention or special thought. As in the seventh part, cause and effect? Where do you see special thought? Um, at the end of the quote. In Jeffries or, or in the? Uh, uh, in Jeffries, it, he says special, special thought. And Tukhtin Jinpa said, pure altruistic intention. Uh -huh. Right. Of utterly pure altruistic intention, right? Mm -hmm. Clarity of vision of utterly pure altruistic intention. So you're wondering what... If it's, what that... it's referring to the same special thought that we can find in the seven part man and uh, seven part cause and effect. No, I don't think so. Okay. I think it, it's talking because uh, that is a cause of bodhicitta, mm -hmm. that special thought. It's not bodhicitta itself. So this is talking about a uh, special clarity of their uh, of their bodhicitta. Yeah, makes sense. Okay. Not sure. I think I think so. Okay. So then continuing. So those those were quotations that was a little bit indented in the text, right? Those are quotations, two different verses. They're not a. I don't think those two are adjacent. They're many verses apart. Um, in the the uh, in the liberating story of Maitreya, you can find in the Avatamsaka, right, fifty fourth chapter. So then Lama Sonkapa's commentary continues, although the explanation of the commentary. And when we you just say commentary, um, yeah. So commentary means um, Chandra Kurdi's auto commentary, right? No, no. Explanation of the commentary means uh, Jayananda's explanation of Chandra Kurdi's. Uh, Majama Kavatara auto commentary. So the explanation. So this is this is talking about uh, Jayananda's view. Let me just get if I can. Yeah. So in fact, in Jeffrey's uh, translation, he says in the commentary, Jayananda. In his commentary, Jayananda. So in the explanation of the commentary by Jayananda, uh, he interprets the meaning of these two citations in terms of verbally derived awakening mind, or as Jeffrey translates it, as referring to conceptual mind generation. The phrases on the beginner stage and having generated the mind not long ago are to be understood in terms of ultimate awakening mind. So he says, although, although uh, Jayananda interprets these two as talking about conventional bodhicitta, they actually refer to uh, ultimate bodhicitta, ultimate awakening mind. For instance, it was mentioned above in those quotations that birth in the lineage of the Tathagatas begins from the first ground. So one was not. When one enters into the Mahayana path, you are maybe of Mahayana lineage, you are born in the Mahayana lineage, but you're not born into the Tathagata lineage until you achieve the first Bhumi. Maybe the differentiation being uh, the Tathagata lineage, uh, being born into that means that you have constant practice of the Bodhisattva deeds impelling you toward Tathagatahood, if you want, you know, Buddhahood, Tathagatahood. 
in these two sutra citations, that almost in, in Jeffries, it almost looks like they're just one long quotation. Tukhtin Jimpa did separate them. In these two uh, sutra citations, apart from the two distinct metaphors, what are the two metaphors? Jennifer? Well, the one was that born to the, the born as the son of a king, and the other is born to the king of the Garudas or something like that, right? Two different metaphors. Uh, in these two sutra citations, apart from the two distinct metaphors, born to the king, born to the Garuda, uh, their reference is the same. Furthermore, their reference meaning the first ground bodhisattva. Furthermore, the meaning of these three lines of the root text, those, you know, the, the verse that came before, even when abiding in the first ground of the mind of full awakening, he surpasses those born from the sage's speech and the Pratika Buddhas through the power of his merit, and his merit increases ever more. Um, where was it? These three lines of the root text appear to summarize the content of the cited sutra. As for the awakening mind of pure altruistic intention, which was, I think, Mikhail's question just a moment ago, right? you were asking about that. Many sources, including the ornament of the Mahayana Sutras, the Mahayana Sutra Alamkara, describe this as the awakening mind of the first ground. So as, remember, Mikhail, you were asking whether that was altru the awakening mind of pure altruistic intention, whether that sounded like the special thought, the, the, that special thought in the seven elements of cause and effect, that's a cause of bodhicitta, right? So this is referring to the um, mind, the bodhicitta of the first ground. Are we okay? John, are you following? Yes, Genla. <laughs> Genla. Aida, you have a question. So that would be, um, one has realized the emptiness of the mind. Is that correct? Uh, one has realized directly the emptiness of all phenomena. It doesn't mean you know and them individually, okay. so mind would be included there, yeah? They have the realization of the emptiness of the mind. And uh, that's important because, as I mentioned before, the, when the Dalai Lama has talked about that, you know, when you talk about the emptiness of the mind, one of the special practices called Mahamudra, which we're kind of doing in our meditation at the beginning, we're, we're meditating on the conventional emptiness, uh, conventional nature of the mind. Uh, if you realize the ultimate nature of the mind, that you re realize the emptiness of the mind, His Holiness has said, um, a practitioner who has that realization can make especially rapid spiritual development. So there's something special about that because uh, you may know, you may understand uh, even before you have a direct realization of the emptiness of the mind, you may realize the emptiness of all phenomena, including the mind. But if you specially focus on the emptiness of the mind, uh, everything else, you know, it sort of implies everything, the emptiness of everything else, because everything, we know everything through our mind. If you know that the mind is empty of inherent existence, all of the phenomena that it perceives would follow as also empty of inherent existence. Okay. So as for the awakening mind of pure altruistic intention, many sources, including the Mahayana Sutra Alamkara, ornament of Mahayana Sutras, describe this as the awakening mind of the first ground. Okay. If this is so, one might ask. So another, so this, is, so this is a qualm, okay? If this is so, one might ask, do you deny, do you, Tsongkhapa, 
deny that the conventional awakening mind of a bodhisattva on the ordinary stage outshines the shravakas and pratika buddhas? Almost you know, too many negative particles in there, right? Do you deny? Uh, do you deny that? So, in other words, you're you're saying that these quotations say that the bodhisattva on the first ground outshines the shravakas and pratika buddhas in terms of merit, in terms of lineage. So, are you saying that the the bodhisattva on the path of accumulation doesn't outshine them? So Tripton Chippa says, this is indeed not the meaning. Jeffrey translates that as, it is not so. We do assert as such. So in other words, we do assert that the bodhisattva and the path of accumulation also outshines the hearers and solitary realizers. Although these quotations are talking about the bodhisattva on the path of seeing and the first Bhumi, right? But still the earlier bodhisattvas also outshine the hearers and solitary realizers. For in that very sutra, right? The sutra uh, of Maitreya's liberation. Um, okay, I'll read what Tupten Jimpa has here first. Child of the lineage, Vikipu, Buddha it is like this, even a broken piece of diamond, the most precious of stones, still outshines all of the amazing ornaments of gold. Well, outshines may not, kind of means it, it, it wins them all, you know, it's, it's more, more uh, you know, it suppresses them. When you say outshines, you, you shouldn't think that a diamond sends out light or the gold ornaments send out light or that it reflect more. It, it just means that it's, it's more, you know, majestic. Even a broken piece of diamond, the most precious of stones, still outshines all the amazing ornaments of gold. It does not lose the title king of all precious stones, which might be attributed to a big piece of diamond, you know, that's the king of all precious stones, uh, like the lion is the king of animals, right? It does not lose the title, the king of all precious stones, even though it's broken, and it can totally relieve poverty. You know, even a little piece of diamond. So this is reminiscent of the discussions in the, the Lojong te teachings, right? When we say the, uh, uh, even, a, even a, a little bit of bodhicitta, even a, even a, you know, a semblance of bodhicitta outshines all other virtues in the same way that even a sliver of diamond uh, outshines other ornaments. It's more majestic, you might say, than them. Likewise, child of the lineage, the diamond that is the mind generated for the omniscient state, so that would mean, in this case, conventional bodhicitta, though it may lack power, why does it lack power? Because it doesn't have the same power as the, as the ultimate bodhicitta on the first bhumi, which gives the power to continually practice the bodhisattva's deeds. You know, that, that, that bodhisattva on the first bhumi is completely obsessed. Everything is like Lama Zopa dedicating every bite of food, you know. Uh, Though it may lack power, it still outshines all the golden ornaments that are the qualities of the Shravakas and Pratika Buddhas. He who possesses this does not lose the title of Bodhisattva, you know, who has a conventional Bodhicitta, and, and such a mind overcomes all the indigence of cyclic existence. What does that mean, indigence? Who's our English scholar here? What does indigence mean? Lacking poverty. Poverty, yeah. How does Jeffrey Hopkins translate that? So Jeffrey says, it is not so. We do assert that the Bodhisattva 
on the path of accumulation and so forth have bodhicitta. They, they, they do outshine the heroes and solitary realizers. The liberation of Maitreya Sutra says, uh, he gives that quotation, Even though the diamond-like generation of aspiration to omniscience lacks urgency, it overpowers all the golden ornaments of the qualities of the hearers and solitary realizers. With this aspiration, one will not lose the name Bodhisattva. One is a Bodhisattva on the path of accumulation. And all poverty of cyclic existence is overcome. Tukhtin Jimish said, in, what is that, indigence, all poverty. So this is verse, these are verses 305 and 306 in, if you, if you go to that sutra on the 84,000 site. So the way they translate it, noble one, even if a diamond is broken, it is superior to all other jewels and outshines ornaments of gold. In the same way, even a diamond even if the diamond jewel of the development of aspiration to omniscience becomes broken through, one fo through one's following erroneous thoughts. So that would, that would sound like the way that they're interpreting it is though you still have some erroneous thoughts. You haven't realized emptiness directly. Uh, it still outshines the golden ornaments that are the qualities of the Shravakas and Pratika Buddhas. And then the second, th uh, verse 306, chapter 54, noble one, even if a diamond is broken, it will dispel all poverty. In the same way, even if the diamond jewel of the development of the aspiration to omniscience becomes broken through not being practiced. So that implies you're not, you haven't reached the path of seeing because there in the path of seeing you're always practicing the Bodhisattva Thes. Even if it becomes broken through not being practiced, it can still dispel the poverty that is samsara. Okay. Make sense? So you can do your own research on these. You know, if you if you find uh, a quotation from Sutra and something you're reading and you think you, you can't quite understand the translation in English, you could try to find the, uh, other translations of that that other people have done. And sometimes, if you know Tibetan, of course, or Sanskrit, you can go back and do your own translation. But if you don't yet know those, you can read other English translations and sometimes see the subtlety of what's going on. Okay, almost at the end here. In the compendium of training, who wrote the Compendium of Training? Paul, do you know? That's uh, Shantideva. That's the Shanti other Deva. one. The Shiksa Samuchaya. Shiksa Samuchaya. So Samuchaya again, Compendium. In the, the Siksha Samuchaya, the, the above sutra is cited, that is the sutra, the, the liberation of Maitreya, is cited to substantiate the point that one should not disparage an awakening that is divorced from the bodhisattva deeds. So I was able to find, it was very difficult to find what verse in the Sikshya Samachaya he was talking about, but I think this is the one uh, in the Charles Goodman translation. He, he, trans, he, trans, he translates it as the training anthology instead of uh, compendium. He says anthology of trainings. Um, he translates, you should not despise the awakening mind. Jim just said awakening. You should not despise the awakening mind, even if it is not accompanied by practice, because it still produces endless happiness within cyclic existence. So divorced from practice means it hasn't yet reached the path of seeing when practice is continual, okay? This is described in the noble spiritual biography of Maitreya. So that's that's the quotation he's talking about. So um, you shouldn't despise a bodhisattva or disparage an awakening that is divorced from the bodhisattva deeds. You know, someone who is maybe not practicing completely, but they have bodhicitta. 
And that is impossible for someone who has attained the bodhisattva grounds. So for someone who's attained the grounds, there's no way to be divorced or separated from the bodhisattva deeds. They're constantly practicing them. That is impossible for someone who has attained the bodhisattva grounds to have an awakening mind divorced from the deeds. Okay? So I'm just going to read this next section. Uh, this is where we'll start next time. Just read the title. How on the seventh ground, Shravakas and Pratika Buddhas are outshone by means of the Bodhisattva's intelligence. Right? Oops. Okay. What page is that on? So I can make a note so I don't have to ask someone next time. What page is that on? Page 77. Page 77. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So that's where we're going to start next time. How did I not get that? Add note. Page 77. Done. Okay. So any questions? How are we doing? Jennifer? You okay? Violet, are you are you there? It's too late. Singapore. Okay. A couple of people will be are listening to the uh recordings. So I try to send them the links. Okay. So we're going to uh we're going to do a Dedication prayers. And uh, Sheila, would you like to put up the dedication prayers? Oh, nice. You changed due to these virtues. Okay. Gewadi Nyurdu Da Lama Sange Drugyurne Droa Chikyang Malupa Dei Sala Gupa Due to these virtues, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings, all migrators, without exception, into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel Bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. That's actually a uh, not a dedication, that's actually prayer uh, in the prayer of Maitreya but we can understand it as like a dedication due to these merits. May the supreme precious Bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. And then the long life prayers. Wish, grant, oh, wish granting, wish fulfilling jewel, source of every single benefit and happiness in this world to the incomparably kind attendant Tenzin Gatsu, I beseech. May all your holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. So th this is not exactly, we're not beseeching Tenzin Gyatso to fulfill his wishes. What we're, it says, so uh, what Debso, I pray, uh, May your, your wishes be fulfilled, meaning that due to our overcoming our lack of guru devotion and so forth, other obstacles to the manifestation of your wishes being fulfilled, may they come about. And then, next one. So for Lama Zopa Rinpoche, you who uphold the subduer's moral way, who serve as the bountiful bearer of all, sustaining, preserving, and spreading Manjunath's victorious doctrine. 
who masterfully accomplishes magnificent prayers honoring the three jewels, Savior of myself and others, your disciples, please, please live long. And then for all of our, our oh, you don't have the, the other long life prayer. Okay, to our spiritual guides in general. Okay, so that's enough. So I just wanted to say one other thing before we finish. Someone in class asked about uh, uh, self-cherishing thought. You know, when, when we talk about Rang Chen Zin Gi Lo, I can't find any source in Sanskrit uh, for Rang Chen Zin Gi Lo, but it's what's talked about in Shantideva's Bodhisattva Chara Vitara. When we talk about equalizing and exchanging self and others, what it means is we want to exchange our attitude, which is present now, where we cherish ourself more than others. We want to exchange that thought so that we, and I'm saying right now, we, we cherish ourselves more than others and we ignore others. We want to exchange it to a thought where we cherish others more than ourselves and we ignore our own self interest. That's one of the special causes of generating bodhicitta equalizing and exchanging self with others. So uh, cherishing others, overcoming the, the cherishing of oneself, seeing the faults of self-cherishing thought and the benefits of cherishing others are some of the, the important precepts of the lojong, the training of the mind. So thank you very much. Thank you for your patience. Uh, look forward to seeing you next week. Uh, hopefully JC and Paul Hackett can uh, get together and uh, catch up. Uh, take care. I, I'm thinking next week we have class, but the week after that, I may ask uh, indulgence because I'm having an operation that Wednesday not this coming week, next week we'll have class, but the week after that, I have an operation on the 16th and I'll be under anesthesia. So I don't know if I'll be even crazier than usual uh, by Saturday, you know? So I may, I may ask your indulgence to take that one week off. So anyway, look forward to seeing you again next week. Take care. Thank you so much, Venerable George. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you, Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Sheila. Bye. Well, next week.